there is no more compelling story in the Old Testament than that of David, who rose from a simple shepherd boy to become the giant slayer, the poet laureate of Israel, and her greatest and most beloved king. The Old Testament devotes no less than 66 chapters to his story, more than to anyone else. And still today, the symbol of the Jewish faith is a six-pointed star, the Star of David. And there persisted among God's people a hope, an expectation across the centuries that one day Yahweh would anoint a king of kings, a Mashiach, in Greek a Christos, and he would be called the son of David. I'm Ken Durham. I teach in the Lipscomb University College of Bible and Ministry. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this new series of Bible studies we're calling David's Supporting Cast. We've invited eight gifted students of the Bible, eight women, to explore the wild and fascinating story of King David through the eyes of some of the main characters in his life, David's Supporting Cast. We think these studies will bless and challenge you to go deeper in your studies of the Word and will ultimately point you beyond a remarkable and very flawed person named David, to the person we believe to be the true King of Kings, God's Messiah, Jesus the Lord. We're joined by Lauren Calvin Cook, and I'm especially glad to have you at the table with me as we shared a classroom not all that here. long ago. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, thank you for agreeing to help us understand the life of David mm -hmm. uh, better. Uh, but before you make your presentation, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, schooling, what you're doing now. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in Middle Tennessee, and then I came to college here at Lipscomb University and studied theology and ministry and youth ministry. As you know, since you taught me how to preach, so if this doesn't go well today, we'll know who to blame. It's all on me. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And <laughs> it was here that I met my amazing husband, JP. And uh, the two of us, after we graduated two years ago, went to Princeton Seminary to work on our Masters of Divinity. And we enjoyed doing ministry together so much that we got married after our first year there. And so that's been a really great experience um, learning up there uh, in New Jersey. And one of my particular interests right now in academia is um, the intersection of Old Testament and practical theology, mm -hmm. specifically youth ministry and how we can use the Old Testament as a resource. Um, to better understand our role in God's story in congregations. Um, and JP and I work at a church in Princeton, Princeton Church of Christ, uh, and we work as youth ministers there, and we have a great group of high school kids, and we love it up there. So. Yeah. Good. Well, we're proud of what you and JP are doing, thankful that you could bring your gifts to this project. Today you're going to talk a little bit about Michael, and I don't know how much we have focused on the character of Michael Not much. <laughs> in the life of David, but uh, we're about to, so we eagerly anticipate what you have to teach us about David's wife, Michael. Thanks. Today I want to start off by telling you a story, and it begins like all good fairy tales. Once upon a time, in a kingdom far away, there lived a princess. And in her father's army was a dashing young soldier who captured the princess' heart. They were both courageous and quick-witted, and they loved fiercely and passionately. But the young soldier was too poor to afford the impossibly high bride price to marry her. Instead, he offered what he did have, strength and bravery. So the king agreed that he could marry the princess for the price of 100 of his enemies' lives. What the soldier and the princess didn't know is that the king set this dangerous price because he feared the young soldier's strength and secretly wanted him dead. And so not knowing, the young soldier squared his shoulders resolutely, and he set out to win the hand of his princess. But the king's secret plan was thwarted. He had underestimated the determination of his daughter's suitor. In the cockiness of youth and a reckless display of extravagance, he conquered and killed not 100, but 200 of the king's enemies, because the princess was worth everything he had. It starts like a fairy tale, 
And I wish I could say that they lived happily ever after, but it's not a fairy tale, and they didn't. It's a story of power and politics, of people who make mistakes and seek revenge, of war and violence and jealousy, and all the things that remind us we live in a broken world. It's the story of David, king of Israel, and the princess Michal, his first wife, but not the one he grew old with and had children and grandchildren with, not the one he would love forever, not the one who would live happily ever after. But even though women in McCall's time had little say in anything that happened to them, the first time we're introduced to McCall in uh, 1 Samuel 18, we get a hint that this woman can speak for herself. It's mentioned twice that she loves David, and this is the only time in the Hebrew scriptures where it is said that a woman loves a man. And knowing this, it's even more heartbreaking that her father, King Saul, pretending to give her what she wants, is secretly exploiting her love for David to try to get him killed. But just as Saul underestimated David's strength, he underestimates McCall's as well. Saul tries multiple times to off David, finally deciding to surround his house during the night so that he can kill him in the morning. But when McCall finds out about it, she springs into action, and she lowers David down through the window. And as he escapes and flees away, she takes an idol, and she puts it in the bed, and she makes a covering of goat's hair and puts it on the idol's head, and she covers it with the bedclothes. And then when Saul's messengers come to take David, she tries to buy him a little of time, telling them that he's sick. And when they pull back the bedclothes to see for themselves, Saul is furious and demands to know why his daughter has tricked him. McCall tells him that David threatened her, but the truth is, McCall was the one who talked David into it. It was her idea, her choice, one that she made out of strength, not weakness. One that she made out of love, not out of fear. And this night is a turning point in McCall's life in so many ways. First, because McCall shows what she's made of. I find it ironic and a pretty delightful twist that the princess, whose position in life affords her very little agency, ends up risking her own life to rescue her prince. She's clever, resourceful, strong and incredibly brave. With Saul and his crazy murderous rage, I can't imagine how terrified she was, wondering what he would do to her when he found out that she helped David escape. But her love won out over her fear. Second, it's a turning point in that McCall is forced to choose between her father and the man she loves. She can't be neutral in this political drama. She has to cast her loyalties somewhere. And in choosing David, she sets in motion the downfall of her own father's reign and of her own royal status. And third, we find out what McCall's love is made of. In the beginning, it might have just meant that she was enamored by David, as all of Israel was after this young warrior came on the scene and defeated the giant. But this is a turning point in that, in her action, McCall proves that her love for him is more than admiration, more than desire. She shows sacrificial love of an incredible quality. She loves David enough to let him go, to give up their future together, not knowing if she'll ever see him again. She does, but by then, many years have passed. And in the meantime, David is gallivanting about in the wilderness with a band of ruffians, looting the Philistines and trying to escape from Saul. He takes another wife, Abigail, who is beautiful and quick-thinking and courageous and not afraid to challenge armed and angry men. And, oh, that sounds familiar, almost like McCall 2.0. And here, the fairy tale starts to break down. There's only supposed to be one true love. What about McCall? How could David replace her so easily? And as if anticipating the question, the narrator goes ahead and answers it. After David escaped, Saul gave McCall to a man named Palti. She's no longer referred to as McCall, David's wife. Now she's referred to as the daughter of Saul. Given and taken, 
taken and given. McCall is just property exchanging hands, abandoned by one man and given to another. In the meantime, after Saul's death, David begins to gain power. There's a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grows stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grows weaker. And when David finally unites the two kingdoms, he sends orders for Michal to be taken from Palti and returned to himself. Some commentators think that David was trying to protect Michal, knowing that Saul's descendants would be in danger once he took over, that he was trying to protect her and he did it out of love. Other people think that his marriage to a descendant of Saul would doubly validate his reign, and so maybe he did it for political reasons. But whatever the reason, they send for McCall, and she's taken from palsy, and the poor man follows behind her, weeping the whole way. But David and McCall's reunion is conspicuously absent from the story. Is she excited to see him again, or is she bitter at the wasted years? Do they hug and kiss and cry happy tears, or is she just ushered unceremoniously into his harem to wait? It's a big empty question mark, but the last chapter that we get in McCall's story may give us some indication, and it's not their happily ever after. After David has united the two kingdoms and conquered Jerusalem, making it his capital, he brings the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem as a tangible reminder of God's presence. And as the Ark is being carried into Jerusalem, David is dancing and leaping and celebrating wildly in the crowd, wearing only a linen ephod, which didn't leave much to the imagination. And while all this is going on, McCall is watching from an upstairs window, and she's disgusted by David's immodest display, and in her heart she despises the man she once loved. It seems like years of disappointment and heartbreak and loss have made her bitter and cynical. She's no longer the young, idealistic princess who dreamed of the dashing young warrior. When David comes back to the house, McCall comes out to meet him. Even after all that has happened to her, she hasn't lost her gutsy ability to challenge power. She may not have much choice in what happens to her, but oh, she can hold her own in a battle of wills. She scorns David, and her words are dripping with sarcasm. Well, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in front of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would do. There seems to be a lot going on in what McCall says. Maybe there's a hint in her pointedly calling him the king, like he has embarrassed her by not acting like one. But I think there are also some pretty clear undertones of sexual jealousy. She had given herself to him, loved him, saved his life at her own risk. He had married her, discarded her, and then taken her away from the husband who loved her. And now, not only does she have to share him with other wives, but he is flaunted to the slaves of slaves, the lowest of the low, what he has not given to his queen. I think Robert Alter sums it up well when he says that it doesn't take a psychologist to see that her anger is a compilation of all the tension beneath the surface that's never been spoken. McCall has been hurt and used by men in so many ways, and now it all comes out in a torrent of bitterness and sarcasm. But as author Nora Lofts points out, no woman feels shame for or wishes to hurt the man in whom she's no longer interested. Maybe McCall's pain speaks louder here than her love, but the two are close companions, which makes it even more cringeworthy when David responds with equal spite. I was dancing before the Lord, who chose me instead of your father to be king. And I'll be even more undignified than this, and these slave girls you speak of will hold me in high honor. Essentially, if you don't like me dancing half naked, I'm going to dance naked, and the slave girls are going to love it. And may I remind you that God likes my family better than yours. McCall isn't even given the opportunity to respond. Whether she was speechless or removed from David's presence, or whether her words just aren't recorded, we never hear from McCall again. Her story ends with just one more painful sentence. 
Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Some people read this as a divine judgment on Michal, reading into the narrative that Michal was seriously in the wrong here and that God punished her with barrenness. But the text doesn't suggest anything like that. The narrator adds no commentary on her actions, gives no reason for her barrenness. It could be a coincidence, but from what we know of the story, it would also be very possible that David refused to give her children, either out of spite after she tried to publicly shame him, or because any child of theirs would be a descendant of Saul and have a possible claim to the throne. And whether her barrenness was coincidental or had the added disgrace of being intentional, we can guess that the rest of McCall's life was far from fulfilling. And while David's story continues, this is the end of McCall's, the woman who loved and was left, who spoke out and was silenced. It's common to interpret this story in David's favor. A lot of people, without knowing the background of the story, tend to isolate this confrontation between David and McCall and interpret it as some kind of statement on worshiping God freely without caring what other people think. And if we interpret it that way, with David as the role model of total abandonment to God, it pretty clearly puts McCall in the wrong as the one trying to curb his passion. There's even a camp song about rejoicing and being undignified, and a poem that warns would-be worshipers that McCall still lurks in the pews. And that shows that the mainstream interpretation of McCall has been pretty far from favorable. Yet as a woman reading her story, I tend to side with McCall, whose life has been far from happy and who has just been spurned and disgraced by the man she once loved. Just because David was a man after God's heart doesn't mean he was perfect. We already know from the story of Bathsheba and Uriah that he made some pretty big mistakes. And so it's not too hard for me to read this story and think that the way he treated McCall was one of them. But I think it may be even fairer to the characters and more true to the text to say that this story is complicated, that real life is complicated, and that in the end, maybe it's not so much about who's right and who's wrong as it is about where God is working in all of this, how God is redeeming the messy and the broken, even when we can't tell right from wrong, and even when we're a little of both. But I still find it so unsatisfying to wrestle with all of these loose ends. I'm left with a lot of burning questions about McCall's story. Did she hear about David's battles and wonder why he never came back for her? Whatever happened to Palti, the guy who adored her? Why doesn't she have children? And, and she did this incredibly courageous thing of saving David's life at her own risk, but for what? So he could leave her? Does David ever feel remorse for the pain he's caused her? And maybe the most poignant question, the one that resonates with us the most, the one that we've probably asked ourselves, what was the point of all this? Maybe sometimes the messy bits and pieces of McCall's story remind us of our own. Often instead of feeling like we're in control, our lives feel more like they're being swept along by a current that we can't control. Or we give sacrificially of ourselves only to go unnoticed or unappreciated, or to be rewarded with only more hardship. Maybe there are loose ends in our stories that can't be woven in to make a tidy ending. We want closure or resolution, which is something that good made-up stories always have, and something that real-life stories rarely have. I don't understand why he left. No matter what I did, things just kept getting worse. It just doesn't make sense. I gave it my everything, but for what? Lack of closure can make us feel like a part of us is missing, even after the wounds heal. And even more than closure, we need to know the point of it all. We desperately need for God to make meaning of our meaninglessness and to bring closure to what is unfulfilled and unhealed in us. It's easy to have faith when we see the pieces coming together, when we feel like God shows up at every turn, when we feel like our lives have meaning and purpose. But it's not always that way. Sometimes our past is messy and our future looks bleak and nobody answers when we ask why. 
Yet this is exactly why we are called to have faith. Because faith is being sure of what we don't or can't see. It's believing in and holding on to a bigger story in a God who is at work even when we can't see. We're all part of a story larger than ourselves. It began long before us, and it continues long after us, and it encompasses all of creation. That's why the creation story is part of our story. Why we still tell the story of the Exodus and find hope in it. It's why we tell the story of Jesus, and even why we tell this story of David and McCall. If this were just the story of Princess McCall, it would be a pretty terrible story with a really depressing ending. But it's about so much more. It's a story of the people of God, and every one of those stories is about how much God's people need saving. The hero of the story isn't David or Michal. The hero of the story is God, who alone can slay the dragon, right the wrongs, and rescue both prince and princess. There isn't a perfect climax and resolution in the story of Michal, because it isn't the whole story. And your story may not seem complete by itself. It may have crooked edges and bumps, but that's because it's only one puzzle piece in a grander narrative. The redemption we long for isn't just closure to your story or to mine. It's closure to the story, the whole great drama of creation and fall and exodus and covenant and incarnation and crucifixion and resurrection in which you and I only play a small part. And each of our stories is caught up and redeemed in the saving story of God. And because of that, there's a little more I have to say about McCall. First, she didn't let herself become a victim of her circumstances. It's true that there were many things she had no control over, but she was never passive. She asserted herself, saved lives, challenged power, and loved passionately, doing what she could with what she had been given. And second, none of McCall's story was wasted. And although she gave of herself and never saw results, her sacrifice meant something. In the midst of it all, God was working. It's true that she had no children of her own, and so she was not the one through whom David's descendants came. But in saving his life, she preserved his line. And in preserving the line of David, McCall was preparing the way for the one who would be the true protagonist. The one who would see and hear and affirm the value of women like her. The one who, like McCall, would one day be passed back and forth between rulers in their political games. The one who, like her, would be publicly scorned and humiliated. The one who is abandoned by those he loved. The one of whom Isaiah prophesied, who can speak of his descendants? for his life was cut off from the earth. The one who would understand and live the pain in every movement of her story. The one who would make meaning of her life and not just bring closure to her story, but open it up again because there are more pages to be written. McCall, along with Rahab and Ruth and even David, paved the way for Christ. In her lifetime, McCall never saw meaning or closure or results. Yet that places her within a great company, a great cloud of witnesses of those who have lived and died without seeing. The author of Hebrews writes of Old Testament heroes and martyrs of the church, of these men and women of faith. They were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. None of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. When I think of people who died without seeing, feeling alone and empty, one of the people who comes to mind is, surprisingly enough, Mother Teresa. She spent her life caring for the poor and the sick in the slums of Calcutta, but no matter how hard she worked, there was more to do the next day. No matter how many lives she saved, there were lives she couldn't save. What was the point? 
After her death, it came to light that Mother Teresa wasn't sure, and that for 50 years, as she selflessly served, she felt abandoned by God. She wrote to one of her spiritual confidants, The silence and emptiness is so great that I look and do not see. I listen, but I do not hear. And yet Mother Teresa will be canonized as a saint this year. Even though she couldn't recognize the presence of God in her life, the church recognizes and honors her role in the story of God. Christ himself poured himself out for his followers, who betrayed and abandoned and denied him. And he cried out, why, God, why have you forsaken me? And the sky went dark, and he died without an answer. Like the writer of Hebrews, I could go on and on speaking of the characters in God's story, of the soldiers and civil rights activists who have died for freedom without living to see it, of martyrs who have given their lives to a cause without seeing its fruit, of doctors and social workers who have invested in others and never seen the impact they had, of pastors who sowed without reaping, of parents and spouses and siblings and friends who have given their heart to another only to feel that their love was wasted. But the story doesn't end there. Freedom is coming. Seeds planted will be harvested. Lives given will be raised. Hearts broken will be mended. And love poured out is never, ever wasted. Sometimes our lives seem put together. We we feel like we know what's going on, we're in control, things are falling into place, but sometimes our lives look more like McCall's. Maybe we love and are left. Maybe we speak out and are silenced. Maybe things don't work out the way we expected or hoped, we don't get our happily ever after. Like her, sometimes we have questions that need answers. Relationships or lost opportunities that don't get closure, pain that needs healing. But it's these unfinished stories that show us how badly we need a better one, one that can make meaning of our lives. And as Christians, the story we hold on to is the story of God, the story that God is at work redeeming the world, that God is making all things new, that there's a better way to live than striving for power and seeking revenge and being held captive by fear, and that the better way is love. And we know the ending to this story from Revelation 21 and 22. And it paints this beautiful picture of the kingdom of God that sounds kind of like a fairy tale. John describes his vision with the imagery of the church as a rags to riches bride and Christ as the king who comes back to restore peace to a war-torn land. With the city his bride has loved and wept for, being made beautiful again beyond her wildest dreams, with walls made of precious stones and the gates made of pearl and sidewalks and streets made of gold, and a river in the middle of the city from which everyone can drink and no one will be turned away. And the king issues an edict that the gates will never be shut because there will be no more war. And he finds his princess and he changes her rags to a robe of white. And with love in his eyes, he wipes away the last of her tears and tells her to take heart because all of the pain and brokenness has been done away with. I can picture McCall there and David and Saul and Palsy weeping at the things that have been and then weeping tears of joy because it's all been made right because they and the stories they've lived are finally heard and understood, fully known and fully loved. And there's no more division between the kingdoms, no more jealousy and revenge, and their lives are being knit back together, old wounds being healed as they see how God's story unfolds. And maybe in the end, McCall is the one who is dancing. Because we know the ending, we are called to live courageously in the middle, even as we wait, walking by faith, not by sight. We are called to be a part of God's story, to live out his kingdom here and now, to love boldly, to enact justice, and to have faith that your story is never wasted, that your life is held within the story of God.
Okay, first of all, I've been calling her Michael for a long time. But now, in my defense, I had I knew a godly Christian couple who had a little girl, and they so admired this character that you have mm -hmm. opened up to us that they named her and called her Michael. Hmm. All right. But I stand corrected. You're the Old Testament scholar. <laughs> oh, and, goodness, and no. That is one of, one of several good things that you have taught me uh, today, Lauren. Thank you for taking Scripture seriously. Mm-hmm. We're showing us scripture and the story it tells the way it tells it. Mm -hmm. My question is, and I think you, you, you approach this a bit, uh, we, we would much prefer the fairy tale version. Mm -hmm. And this one starts out, you know, once upon a time kind of, kind of tale, but, but then it begins to, to, the wheels begin to fall off mm -hmm. and it becomes a story that the Disney folks would never touch. <laughs> I think right. so but why does the Bible do that do you think how do you understand these themes and characters and elements in Scripture that that are so hard uh, to to face head-on and where is there something redemptive in telling these Bible stories the, the way they were given to us and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and preserved for us I think the stories are there because life doesn't change much um, and although culture changes and times change, I think there's uh, something that we can relate to so much in so many of these Old Testament stories and the characters and the lives that they've lived. And it's not perfect. It's messy. Um, and I think often we come to Scripture trying to look for a direct moral application from a story. And, and I think that's apparent even in the way that this story is interpreted, uh, how people look at this, this story of David dancing naked and we try to take away something that we can apply to our lives and say, oh, well, we should worship God the way David did. But I think... Uh, that sort of moral application isn't always apparent in a text, and I think it's just as faithful of a reading of scripture to come to the text looking for how we identify with these characters. And, and I mean, if we want to take a moral lesson from the story of McCall, we could say that she's a model for us in her courage and self-sacrifice, and I think that would be true. But when I look at the story, I tend to think, here's someone who knows what it's like to be forgotten. You know, here's, here's what it's like to not have any options. And I think that's just as important as the moral lessons that we take from Scripture to, um, to identify with the other characters in the story, to cry out to God on their behalf and on ours, mm -hmm. to wrestle with the text even when there's not a happy ending, and to understand that we're all on this journey together and, um, in the story of God. And, and, you know, when there's a lot of pain in our lives, sometimes we don't want advice or solutions. We want to be heard and understood. And, and I think it's okay to read scriptures that way sometimes too. Yeah. I, I want to thank you for many things in this message, but one of which is just the image of a day when perhaps we'll see Michael dancing. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Um, that's the redemptive hope mm -hmm. for Absolutely. us all as it was for David and those who were greatly wounded by David. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think you've done a bit of rehabilitation here uh, in, in fleshing out, you know, the, the person of Michael, you know, I, I think we have too easily just known her mm -hmm. as that uh, grouchy wife who yes. threw cold water on a king's <laughs> worshipful exuberance. Yes. Shame on you, Michael. Shame <laughs> on you. Uh, and uh, it certainly wasn't the first time that, that David does something kind of outrageous right. uh, and gets all kind of different reactions. And, and maybe many of us have reacted the way she did. Mm -hmm. um, but. Of, of, of the many qualities in Michael, and again, I, I think you're so wise to not say, well, we've got to make a hero out of her instead of mm -hmm. a hero out of David. That's not the point. God is the hero of this story, mm -hmm. which, which you, so, you, you um, called us to so, so beautifully. But what one quality in Michael would you single out as, mm -hmm. as something that, that, that we can uh, be especially blessed by and appreciative of? That's hard. Uh, there are many qualities that I admire about her, and, and I admire her courage and her boldness, but I, I'd say the one that I admire the most is her love. Um, we, we tend to think of love as a romantic Valentine's Day thing, but uh, she loved boldly, and um, I just I think that's so worth emulating in our lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for not only honoring scripture by bringing it to us the way it was first delivered to us, but by also pointing us ahead to that grander narrative mm -hmm. that you spoke of and even 
capturing it so beautiful in the words of, of Revelation. There's, there's our hope. Uh, there is the great uh, so much more Absolutely. that you spoke of. We appreciate it, Lauren. Thanks. Thank you.